What I wanted to preach on today is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. So I told you to open up to uh, 1 John 5, and what I just want to open with is who is the Holy Ghost? If you look at 1 John 5, it says in verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So what you see here is that in heaven we have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And when it says they bear record, it means they're bearing record of the Word of God. It means that they, they are God. And notice how it says these three are one. So the Holy Ghost is one with the Father and the Word. What, is, what does that mean? That means that He Himself is God. But, obviously, we know the distinction, right? We've gone over the Trinity before. The Father is His own separate uh, person. The Son the Son is His own separate person. And the Holy Ghost is His own separate person. And when I say person, I mean person. Kind of the, the, when we say person, we mean human. Um, but when the Bible says person, as it does in Hebrews when describing God, it says the express image of his person. It means like persona or kind of like um, uh, entity. So God, God the Father is his own person in biblical terms. Jesus is his own person. And the Holy Ghost is his own person. Um, but all three of them together make up God. You can't have God without the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is an integral part of God. Uh, what else do we know about the Holy Ghost? Well, if you look at Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, we can kind of learn what he looks like. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> and if you look at uh, verse 22, it says, And the Holy Ghost... Uh, let's read verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open and the Holy Ghost descended. So where's the Holy Ghost coming from? Heaven, right? It says the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended uh, upon him. But notice what it says in verse 23. It says, I'm sorry, no, <clears throat> verse 22. It says, in a bodily shape, so people get this confused. What is like the main thing that uh, contemporary Christians and other Christians alike use to describe the Holy Ghost? A dove, right? They always show him as a dove and they, and it, they always believe it represents that the Holy Ghost represents a dove. That's why people get like lockets with a dove on them. But what is it saying here? Is it saying that the Holy Ghost descended in the shape of a dove? No, what, it, what it's saying, if you read the verse carefully, it says, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape. If you stop right there, it's saying in the shape of a body, a human's body, because remember, we're made in the image of God. So the Holy Ghost, and I'll prove this to you a little further, he has a, a, a bodily shape. But notice what it says. It says, like a dove. How does a dove descend? A dove descends very delicately. It comes down very delicately. It comes down very, very carefully. So that's where people get the confusion. They read this and they're like, oh, the whole Holy Ghost came down in the shape of a dove and, and fell upon Jesus. However, that's not true. The Holy Ghost has the shape of, a, it has a bodily shape and he, he descended like a dove. It means very carefully upon Jesus to show, um, you know, how... How the, the it, it shows a personality trait of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't come down and like slam on the ground and enter into. He he ascended very delicately into Jesus in in the shape in a bodily shape. And um, we can we can see this even clearer in Genesis one. If you look at Genesis one. And God would never would never um, be okay with people wearing like doves and that kind of thing because you're taking uh, the image of of God that you don't know what He looks like other than the fact that you know He looks like us. You're taking an image and and portraying it to be God. Like you're taking an image uh, of a of a flying thing, which God specifically says not to do, and you're making it as if it represents the Lord, and it does not. You know, so don't don't get caught into the Holy Ghost being a dove and wearing like little lockets. 
or drawing, or drawing doves and making it seem like it is God. If you look at Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. What does that mean? After our likeness. So, who is the R there? Who is the O-U-R? It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When he says R, that means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have the same image. They all look ve very much alike in the sense that, you know, they have a nose, eyes, ears, mouth, they have arms, hands. We got that from them. So if you're wondering what the Holy Ghost looks like, he's not like just some wind. He has a bodily shape. It's just a spiritually bodily shape. When you die and you get a and you get uh, and you go into your spirit, your spirit is going to still look. You're not just going to be like light, you know, just like a, an amoeba. You're going to have your same shape. It's just you won't have a body. You won't have physical flesh. When you die, you'll have a, just a spirit until you get a glorified body, which will have a physical um, presence. Okay, so. Uh, I want to talk all about the Holy Ghost, essentially, you know, how do you receive him? What, what does he do? What is his purpose within you? You know, what, what is going on here? So let's go to John chapter 7. We're going to spend uh, a, few, a few minutes in the book of John. Now that you know what he looks like and who he is, he's God, and he, he has the same image as Jesus and, and the Father. You know, he looks like us. We look like him, technically. <clears throat> John 7. And if you look at verse 38, it says, but uh, <clears throat> look at verse 38. It says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we live in a very special day and age, in the sense that we live after Jesus' time on earth. And what that means is that when Jesus died, one of the blessings that he gave to us was the fact that he was going to give us the Holy Ghost. This was not previously spoken about uh, in the Old Testament. Yes, people would have the Holy Ghost rest upon them, but not often. it was not given in the way that it's given to us that we that believe on Jesus receive the Holy Ghost within us for, for always. You know, oftentimes prophets in the Old Testament, you would see that the Holy Ghost came upon them and they would preach boldly or they would do something mighty. Um, we have a very different experience with the Holy Ghost where the Holy Ghost comes to abide within us. And let me explain that to you a little bit better. So in the Old Testament, when God's house was created, there was a place within, within God's house, within the temple, that was called the Holy of Holies. And what that was is, within it, God would be there all year, right? And once per year, uh, the high priest was allowed to go in there and speak directly with God, but it was actually the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was resting within the temple, and once per year, the high priest would have to, you know, he would have to consecrate himself, he would have to do a special sacrifice for the people, then a special sacrifice for himself, and then he would go within the Holy of Holies, and he would speak directly and be in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. He would be right there with the Holy Ghost. And that was only happening once per year. But what the Lord did and what the Lord showed through Jesus was that Jesus, when he said, I will destroy this temple in three days and then I will raise it up, and he was talking about his body, he was signifying the fact that now the temple, as the Bible says, the temple of God is within you. Now there is no specific one place where the Holy Ghost resides. The Holy Ghost has now made his ab abode within each Christian. That is a new temple. So what that means is that if you believe upon Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you believe with your whole heart that he is your Savior and he did everything to save you, then you receive the Holy Ghost when you get saved. The moment you believe that, the Holy Ghost comes and He abides in you. <clears throat> and if you look at verse, um, 
So that's when you receive it. And if you go to John 14, when you believe, when a Christian believes, and it was, you know, Jesus is saying at this time, oh, you haven't received the Holy Ghost yet because the people who had believed on Jesus, they didn't get it until Jesus died because Jesus had to be glorified for them to receive it. And if you look at John 14, it says in verse 16, it says, <clears throat> And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And when the Bible says even, it means it's, it's re-describing the same thing. So I could say this chair, even this black chair. You know, I'm describing the same thing. So it says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, and he will dwell with, dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So notice, when you believe upon Jesus, and after Jesus died, he gave everybody the Holy Ghost. And why did he do that? We'll learn in a few minutes. But it says, I will, uh, it says in verse 17, uh, he will dwell in you and shall be in you. And in verse 18, it says, I will not leave you comfortless. So the reason that Jesus sent us, uh, sent the Holy Ghost to us is to comfort us, to give us what he was giving the people. So when Jesus was on earth, I'm sure everybody wishes... Um, Everybody probably wishes they got to meet Jesus when he was on earth, right? Everybody would desire that, would, would, would want to be like, and even in this day and age, there's often times where people say, oh, I, I really wish Jesus was on earth so I could ask him this. Or I really wish Jesus was here because he would clear this up. But the case is, and if you look at, um, if you look at John 16, look at John 16, we're going to read one verse and then we're going to go back to John 14. It says in verse, let me see, uh, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So go back to John 14. So it was important that Jesus died and left because when he died, he allowed us to receive the Holy Ghost. And if he did not die and leave, then we would have had to have gone to Jesus for everything, right? We would need Jesus to answer our questions. We would need Jesus to expound upon this and that. We would need Jesus to, the, to do healing and, and, and miracles, etc. But when Jesus gives us the Holy Ghost, he gives us something within us that can comfort us. Notice how it says in verse, um, as we were just saying before, verse 16, it says, I will pray to the... I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. He, Jesus is saying that, yes, I'm, while I'm here, I'm comforting you and I'm helping you. But what would be better would be if I wasn't in an isolated location. Because let's say Jesus was here, right? And let's say he was in Jerusalem, and he didn't give us the Holy Ghost. If you wanted comfort, if you wanted to be guided by Jesus, if you wanted comfort and you wanted wisdom and understanding, you would have to go to him for it, right? Because, and he would be far away, and you may not always see him. You may see him once a year when you go to worship or something like that. But what Jesus is saying, it's better that I leave, and the reason it's better is because when I leave, I will give you the Holy Ghost, and he will be with you permanently. So now, in the sense that we don't need to go to Jesus for it, Jesus is always with us now. He, he has given us God inside us, the Holy Ghost in us, and now we have a constant comforter. And I, I'll explain that to you, what that means and what comes with having the Holy Ghost within you. But just you, if you ever get the notion that, oh, I would rather Jesus be here or I would rather be with Jesus, you know, go, go see Jesus in person. Jesus himself told us it's better that he dies and gives us the Holy Spirit because each one of us has given God in us. Rather than all, all of us having to individually go to God, He put God within us, which is a much different and much better experience, He's saying. He, he's telling that, that, that to us Himself. <clears throat> and if you look, let's go to John 16. So this now we'll start going over um, 
what does he do? And notice he's, uh, how it says he's going to abide with you. He, he's, he's with you. It's not like he's here sometimes and then he goes to somebody else and then the Holy Ghost goes spends time with someone else. He's always in you, specifically. Like, obviously, God is, is so great and so powerful and so mighty that he can put the same amount of Holy Spirit in everybody that gets saved. Even if the whole world got saved, even if the population was tripled, the same amount of people... Uh, everybody can get the same amount of Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is infinite and he spends equal amount of time on each of you. So you have the same Holy Ghost that I have, but you have your own portion of him. It's the same exact spirit. We all have the same spirit. He wants us all to know the same thing. Like the, the Holy Ghost in, in Joel, you know, in, uh, I don't want to use Joel Osteen because I don't know if he's safe, but the Holy Ghost in some contemporary Christian is the same Holy Ghost that's in me. It's the same exact spirit. He wants us to know the same truth. It's just how much do you let him tell you the same truth? How much do you, are you willing to let him guide you? If you look at John 16, now we can go into what does the Holy Ghost do? It says in verse 7, <clears throat> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. But if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So it's a good thing that we get the Holy Ghost. And when he has come, he, re he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So now the Holy Ghost is always here. And he's reproving the world of sin. How does he do that? Well, oftentimes um, he can do it through people's consciousness, right? Uh, for, for, through people's... Um, um, am I saying the right word there? Through people's conscience, right? The thing that makes you feel bad? So, <clears throat> when the, the way the Holy Ghost works is when something is, you know, on your mind and like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That's how the Holy Ghost can reprove people. He can also work through people in the sense that, you know, like I said, we all have the same Holy Ghost. We all have the same one. It's all the same. But, I, you know, let's say I'm up here preaching about some type of sin. That's how we can reprove the world of sin. He can, he can use a certain particular Christian, or let's say you are in particular talking to somebody else, and you're explaining some type of righteousness to them or sin or something. That's how the Holy Ghost can use people, use his portion in us to reprove the world of sin. And it says, uh, of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever thing he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, and he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So, his purpose is to guide and teach you all truth. The Holy Ghost wants nothing more than to, for you to learn and understand truth. You know, think back at your past from where you came, right? Think of all the little steps that the Holy Ghost took you in to get you to where you are now, right? We all weren't reading the King James Bible when we got saved, right? We all weren't going to a good church when we got saved. We all weren't doing the things that we're doing, dressing, you know, women wearing dresses, uh, men working hard. We were all weren't doing the things we were supposed to do, you know, not drinking, until the Holy Ghost, as it says in verse 13, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He is the one who led you to do those things. Most likely, you know, it would be much, much more difficult for you to accomplish those tasks, especially with not growing up to do them. Try teaching somebody out in the world, you know, to, uh, to do something righteous without having the help of God within them. You know, think of how easily you were able to stop drinking, to, you know, change the way you dress, change your mentality towards things. Think of all those things that you have been able to accomplish and do in such a short period of time, right? Like most of us have only been saved for less than a decade, you know, less than a decade. Most of us have only been serving the Lord diligently for a couple years. And in that short time, 
Think of how much you as a person have not only, you know, done things differently, but actually changed in the sense that you enjoy doing them differently. Like you, you can't even see doing it yourself the other way. That you would not be able to do on your own. Think of how, how many times people try and change in the regular world and they don't. They're, they're not able to stop doing this. They're not able to stop doing that. They're not able to stop drinking or drugs or whatever. It's because they don't have the assistance. They don't have the help that the Holy Ghost gives each one of us. So it's such a blessing to have the Holy Ghost within you because he is able to not only guide you towards the right path, but to help you stay on it through his presence within you. If you look at John 14, verse 25, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. So Jesus is saying, while I'm with you, you listen to my word and you understand these things. But look at what it says in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So notice, he's saying, you have me to like right now to come and learn things and, and grow and understand things from, but in the future, you're going to have the Holy Ghost that is going to be in you, and He's going to teach you those things. You're not going to have to come to me. You're going to have the Holy Ghost in you, and He's going to help you to understand through everything that Jesus has said. Remember, this is what Jesus said. Everything in here is what Jesus said. He's going to show you those things through the Word of God. And the way that the, the way that the Holy Ghost does that, how does the, does the Holy Ghost just like give you revelation? Like, does he just teach you doctrine um, out of nowhere? Have you ever just been sitting around and not been thinking about the Bible and then just learn a doctrine? No, that's not how things work. The way the Holy Ghost works in a very specific way. And Jesus tells us how he does it. He says, He will bring all things to remembrance to whatsoever I have said unto you. We know that the word of God is what Jesus says unto us. So let's look at, for, keep a finger in uh, John 14. Keep a finger in John 14 and let's look at 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> It says in verse 11, <coughs> For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So what the Bible's saying here is that the Holy Ghost knows everything about God. He, he, he's, he is God. He knows everything about God. He's the best one to tell you about the things of God. Now, verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are free, freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. So he's about to tell us how the Holy Ghost teaches us what Jesus was telling us he would teach us. How does he do it? He says it right here. It says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So that when the Holy Ghost is trying to teach you something, he needs you to give him the tools to do it. Um, I've used this example before, and it's, it's kind of a worldly example, but it, it makes sense. So there's this, uh, there's this show or movie called The Transformers, and I'm, I'm not saying go watch it or anything. It's just, I know it from my past. And the way that one of the Transformers would speak to the, um, Per, the, the person that was occupying the car is he would turn on a song in the car and he would use the words of the song to tell the person that was in the car what he wanted to say. He would flip to different songs and use specific words, you know, whatever it is. You know, if you want to say I love you, he'd turn to a song and it would say I love you, it would sing I love you, and that's how the car spoke to the person. The way that the Holy Ghost speaks to us is he uses different verses in the Bible to tell you what you need to hear. He will bring you to a verse. He will enlighten you on a verse. He will help you. But if you're not, like in the same way, if that person in the car doesn't turn on the radio or turn, doesn't allow the, or rips the radio out of the car, they'll never get what that car was trying to tell it. In, the, in that same way, the Holy Ghost will not be able to tell you what God wants you to know, what God wants you to learn, and what God needs. Like, let's say you've been praying about something, you want to find the answer. To, it doesn't have to be a doctrine. It can be about something in your life. You've been praying about a, spe a specific thing going on in your life. 
How is the Holy Ghost going to speak to you if he doesn't, he's not speaking audibly. You know those people that say, oh, the Holy Ghost talked to me? No, he didn't. The Holy Ghost, the way he teaches you and the way he, he expounds things to you is through the Bible. He compares spiritual things with spiritual. So if you are praying about something, you want to know the answer to something, it can be the most menial thing. What do I do about this? What should I do in this thing with my family or this or that? You need to give the Holy Ghost a voice to be able to talk to you. And if you are not reading, there's no opportunities for him to bring those things to, and show you and bring them to your remembrance. So give the, the, the reason that I, I often say, you know, we have, the, we have the same Holy Ghost that other people have, and it's the same Go Holy Ghost, it's the same Spirit that wants to teach us the same things, it's just they're not giving Him the means to speak. They're not helping Him to tell them what He wants to hear, because one, they probably don't have the King James Bible. Two, if they do, they're not reading it. You know, you can have somebody who has the King James Bible, but they don't read it that often. They're not going to be spoken to or guided by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost brings things to your remembrance and he uses Jesus' words to do it. Notice how Jesus constantly says, he's not going to speak of himself. He's going to speak of things that I have told you. Jesus is the word of God. The Holy Ghost will tell you those things and he will answer your menial little questions that you have that aren't even regarding doctrine or anything, but he's going to use the word of God to do it because all the answers are here. So if you want more fellowship with the Lord, you want more fellowship with the Holy Ghost, you want the Holy Ghost to be able to give you the peace you're looking for, you want the Holy Ghost to be able to help you and comfort you and give you that, those things that, that you truly need in a friend, you have to let him speak to you. You have to allow him, and it doesn't mean just go like this when every time you read. This is where he wants me to be. You know, you don't, don't play games. Like God, God's not like a. It's not like Russian roulette. Just go through your Bible reading, and oftentimes I'll be praying about like, hey, what sermon should I write? And and out of all, you know, I have a I have a Bible plan that has a has a you know a, a different day, a different Bible verses every single you know different chapters every single day. It just so happens that the thing I wanted to preach on was that next day that I was going to read. And that's how the Holy Ghost taught me, oh, this is what I want you to preach on next week, because uh, he already had a plan that this is when I was going to be reading it. So you just have to give him the opportunity. You have to constantly have that fellowship with him. And the way you have that fellowship with him is through allowing him to speak to you. Let him speak. Let him tell you what God wants you to do. This is a great time. Remember, he is God. So you want God to talk to you. You want God to tell you. This is where he's going to do it. You know, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it's not always about, oh, I need to learn this doctrine and that doctrine. Sometimes it's like, Read the Bible and let God talk to you through it. Let him tell you what he needs to tell you. And he's going to do it. And the more you know, the more he can reference. Like, let's say it's your first read-through. There's a, not a lot he can reference other than what you're directly reading, right? Because you're not going to remember old things. You're not going to remember new things. However, if you've read the Bible a lot of times, while you're reading, he can say, you remember this? How this re references that thing back, you know, that you read in, back in Genesis? And then he can speak to you better. The more you know him, the better he can teach you. <clears throat> so what does he do? He guides you. He teaches you. He gives you peace. And he does it through comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And if you go to Acts chapter 1, you know what else the Holy Ghost can do? If you look at Acts chapter 1, <coughs> it says in verse 8, Acts 1 verse 8, It says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. What else does the Holy Ghost do? He emboldens you. He emboldens you to be willing to do the word of God, to stand up to your family members that say, oh, no, you should be doing this. Oh, you know, why, why are you not drinking with us? Why are you not doing... The Holy Ghost is the one who emboldens you to not be able to... To, to be able to say no to that stuff. And to be able to also to, to, to say yes to the good stuff. To, to say, yes, I'm going to go to church today. Or yes, I'm going to teach you about this thing in the Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach righteousness in some way. You would never... Like, I would never be able to just, like, go up to somebody's house and just knock on their door, somebody we've never met, and just say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? 
you know, without the Holy Ghost being able to strengthen me to do that. It's not something I, I've, I've dreamt about in my past, about something I really wanted to do. I always wanted to be a public speaker. That was never something on my itinerary of things to do. It's the Holy Ghost that emboldens you to do those things. And if you look at Romans chapter 8, the last thing that he does, well, the last thing that we're going to go over that he does, obviously he does infinite amount of, amounts of things that we <coughs> can't always speak about everything. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Ghost prays for you in things that you don't even know that you really need. Like sometimes you're praying for something and it's the wrong thing. You may be praying like, like I've used this example before. Maybe you're like praying that no matter what, Trump needs to get in. But really you don't realize that maybe that's worse off for you. Maybe that's worse off for the country. Maybe that's worse off for something else that, of God's will. And I, like, like I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not pro Biden. I'm not pro anybody. I'm just pro whatever God's will is. So sometimes you will be praying for something, and that's just an example I can use because it's something that everybody understands. You may be praying for something, and the Holy Spirit, He understands your heart behind it, and He gets what you really want, but He, he prays for something else, you know, that's better for you. I use this example too with my wife sometimes. You know, we, we were praying for, when we were praying, when we were looking to get a home, and we were praying for, oh, maybe, what about this home? What about that home? I always told her, hey, you know, the Lord's going to guide us to the right home. The Lord will help us to find which, which one it is. And I, I tried to never pray for a specific house. I, I never said, hey, I want this house. Like, give me this house. I just pr always, no matter where we were at in our search, it was always, Lord, help us to find the right house, whatever house that is. And that's, that's the spirit. Spirit, the Spirit will help you to make those types of prayers. It will pray things for you that maybe you're praying for this one thing, but He knows what you really need. You know, sometimes you pray for something and something totally different works out and then you understand how it was better, how it worked out way better. So those are the things that the Holy Ghost does. And, and his, his purpose is to be your comfort. Because God knows how difficult it is to live in this life, right? Even dealing with other Christians is difficult at sometimes. You know, even, even just dealing with your family, your spouse, your parents, all those things are hard. But with, with the help of knowing you always have somebody with you, in you, and it's your own specific portion of Him, it's, it's your portion of Him. It's not my portion. I didn't give you some of the whole... God gave you your own portion of the Holy Spirit, of Him, gave him of, of Himself. He gave it to you. He's your comfort. He's not my comfort. My, the Holy Ghost helps me in my own specific way. But the Holy Ghost helps you in your specific way. And He's your comfort. But you, you know, have, the more you have fellowship with Him, the more you let Him be your comfort, the more He can work, the more He can do for you. And a good way to have better fellowship with him, we'll go over now, um, is, is to please him. You know, the more you please him, the better he can work through you. And let's go, I'll just go over two quick passages on how to please the Holy Ghost. You know, how can you make it better for, for his environment in there, within you? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 14. <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse uh, 26. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, doing that which is good, that he may, uh, may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So what are the, all those things that we just learned? Um, you know, be angry and sin not. Don't give place to the devil. Do that which is right. You know, work hard with your own hands. Give to others. Don't speak bad unto other people and edify those. Uh, edify other people. And the reason that you do all these things, if you look at verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. 
the reason that God wants you to do all those things is because you have God in you. You know, when you have God with you all the time, I think people forget, you know, they forget how, how great of a blessing it is, but how serious of a thing it is, right? God has given us his Holy Spirit in us. So everything that we're doing and putting ourselves through or saying that's coming out of our mouth, he's like right in the midst of it. And he knew what he was getting himself into, right? He knew we wouldn't be perfect. He knew that we, we were going to do wrong. But he's willing to interject himself into you to, to even though through those instances, he can guide you somewhere better. But the way that you could please him is that when you, when you're doing right he likes to see you do right he wants you to do good he's he's your like he's your biggest support to do right he's your biggest um, your biggest fan to do good he wants you when you're you're when you're doing well when you're not doing all these things when you're not giving place to the devil when you're not be, when you're not sinning when you're edifying others you're not grieving him it says grieve not the Holy Spirit of God because remember he's with you always so if you're talking down to somebody and you're making somebody else feel bad or you're doing something that's wrong, he's in you, he's experiencing it with you. You're putting him through that. Imagine you had a really good friend who you knew was a very good person, right? Very good, but you like brought him, like you know they, they don't like wickedness, they, but you started like cursing in front of them and stuff, right? They would, you would make them uncomfortable, but you knew no matter what, they'd be your friend and they're gonna stay with you through it all. You wouldn't wanna curse in front of them. You wouldn't wanna like talk bad about people in front of them. Because you know that that would that would upset them, and, you, and they're they're your friend. You know you don't want to do do that to them. You don't want to. You know that they're not going to do it. Why are you doing it in front of them? You know why why make why put them through that? That's what the Bible's saying. When you're grieving the Holy Spirit, He doesn't want to experience that stuff. He doesn't want to have to go through that. And if you look at Galatians chapter five. <clears throat> it says in verse 22, Galatians 5, verse 22, just a couple pages to the left. <clears throat> it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So what happens when you're not grieving the Holy Spirit, when you're reading and having fellowship with Him, when you're letting Him comfort you through the Word of God and you're allowing Him? And another way He can comfort you is in fellowship. Like when you go to church, the Holy Ghost can comfort you through other people. Because remember, He's in those other people. So He can say things to you through those people that will help you to feel better. You know, that will, will be that thing that you needed to hear. So the more you let him work, the more he can bring forth fruit. Like if you have a tree, right? And you water that tree constantly, like a fig tree. And you water that tree constantly, you soil around it, you make sure it's getting optimal sunlight, that tree is gonna grow the most figs, right? But what about the tree that you don't water, the tree that you don't soil well, the tree that you don't give any sunlight at all? It's not gonna bear that much fruit. It's not gonna bear any fruit often. So the, if you want more love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, goodness, you want stronger faith, you want to be more meek and have more temperance in your life, you have to water that tree. You got to let that, you got to let the Spirit bear that fruit. And the way that you let the Spirit bear the fruit is that you let Him do what He needs to do. You, you read. You, you have fellowship, you pray, you do those things that allow him to work in you. Because remember, he's your comfort. And the more you have fellowship with him, the more you understand his presence and his, his purpose in you, the better he can work through you because now you have a knowledge of each other. And that's it. That's the whole sermon. I just want to go over the Holy Ghost, you know, his, his fellowship with you, his friendship with you, what he can do for you. He, he is always in you. He's always working with you. And he wants to make you better. He wants, he wants you to know he's there. He wants you to have that fellowship with him. And I'll just close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word. Thank you for your Holy Ghost, which you have given us. Thank you for teaching us uh, these things through your Bible. And we pray that we will have great fellowship with the Holy Ghost, that we will let him bear his fruit and that we will continue to be guided in your path. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.